December 1st, 2021. The time is 5 11 p.m. and I am calling to order the Baldwin Park City Council special meeting. Chief Deputy City Clerk, can I have a roll call? I don't think they can hear you. Would you like me to do the roll call real quick? So, uh, Council Member Damien? Here. Council Member Garcia? Here. Council Member Paul C. Hernandez? Uh, I believe he won't be able to make it. I will make a motion to excuse Council Member Hernandez. Can I get a second? Second. Any objections? Uh, going on. Mayor Pro Tem, Alejandra Avila? Here. Sorry. And then Mayor Emanuel J. Estrada here. So at this moment, we will move to open public communications. If there's anybody looking to speak, uh, now is the time. Chief Deputy City Clerk, was there anybody who requested to speak during a special, during a special meeting? And that is a no. Uh, looking that nobody else in the public is looking to speak, I will now move to close public communication. And I believe that we have an open study session, and that is part two of the Inclusionary Housing Ordinance. Uh, the measure agents incentive presentation. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, good evening. Um, a couple, about a month or so ago, we had part one presentation of an inclusionary housing ordinance uh, for the city. Uh, we're happy to um, introduce Lassar Development again, Craig Edelman and Farzan Mashoud, who are going to be presenting part two, uh, which is the inclusionary housing financial analysis of what an IHO would mean uh, for the city and then uh, uh, end with uh, next steps. And I'll now uh, hand it over to Lassar. Thanks so much, Ron. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, uh, council members and others in attendance. Great to be back with you again today. My name is Craig Edelman. I'm a senior principal with Lassar Development Consultants and I'm joined again by Farzad Mashoud uh, my colleague uh, from Lasar, and uh, our pleasure uh, to be back with you tonight. Tonight we're here to talk again about inclusionary housing and how adopting such a policy could help meet your affordable housing needs and alleviate homelessness in Baldwin Park. So next slide, Ron, please. So this overview of uh, an inclusionary housing ordinance is conducted in the context of implementing Baldwin Park's 2018 homelessness plan. This is the third segment uh, in a series of county measure H implementation related work following uh, our review of accessory dwelling unit incentive programs and uh, Baldwin Park's potential to address affordable housing and homelessness needs through hotel conversions. So tonight we'll provide an assessment of the feasibility of an inclusionary housing ordinance in Baldwin Park and this builds on our prior presentation uh, about the basics of inclusionary housing ordinances. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Farzad to um, take you through a, a portion of the presentation and then I'll circle back with some of the findings. Thanks, Craig, and, and thank you all so much for being here. So on, on the next slide, we have uh, just a few bullets recapping our inclusionary housing 101 presentation. Um, and just the main thing we want to convey here is uh, the city is considering adopting an inclusionary ordinance, and it would be one of a handful of other cities in the San Gabriel Valley to have such a requirement. Um, inclusionary housing ordinances require that certain percentages of the homes in a new development to include units that are affordable to low and moderate income households. Uh, an inclusionary ordinance is one of many tools to increase your affordable housing, and it's the primary tool that leverages land use policy rather than public funds. Uh, state law confirms your ability to adopt an inclusionary ordinance, and you can avoid um, a, a more uh, a time consuming uh, state review by staying within certain guide rails of an inclusionary requirement. The goal of an inclusionary ordinance is to in ensure that 
uh, the requir requirements are not so high that you make development infeasible. And so to get to that, one of the goals, of course, um, and in order to get to that goal, it's important to base your inclusionary requirement on a financial analysis. And so that, that's what we're here to present tonight. So on the next slide, uh, just another um, key point we wanted to recap are these considerations when adopting an inclusionary ordinance. And those considerations are what kind of development app it applies to, whether it's rental or ownership or both, uh, and how many units, uh, how many homes are in those developments, single family, multifamily, is it five, 10 units? Uh, what sort of threshold do you wanna have? Another key consideration is the percentage of uh, units that are required to be affordable, is it five, 10, 15, think something like that. And to make sure, again, it's not so high that you prevent development. Um, and then finally, it, another key consideration is to ensure that you're able to monitor uh, these deed restrictions so that when you say this unit is affordable, it stays affordable and you as a city are able to monitor that. Uh, and, and you have your own housing authority, which has a lot of expertise in this area. So that, that's a really big um, asset. Next slide. Um, so like I said, and Craig said, we're here to talk about the results of our financial analysis. So I'm, I'm going to just describe how we did it um, really briefly at a, at a high level. Um, so we first began by looking at the real estate market in Baldwin Park um, and, and looking at recent developments and recent sales transactions of newly built and somewhat newly built homes in the last three, four years um, to see what, what is really the market rate of housing in Baldwin Park, specific to Baldwin Park. Um, as well as to understand what is the cost of land that can be developed for housing. Uh, we then created four uh, different prototype developments. Two of them are home ownership prototypes and two of them are rental prototypes. And these are meant to reflect the type of development that actually happens in the city. And we'll get into more detail about those prototypes. Um, and then we analyze those prototypes in, with the real estate market and conducted what's called a residual land value analysis. This just, again, to briefly recap, we talked about last time how an inclusionary ordinance pushes the cost of affordable units to the landowner. Um, and so a residual land value analysis asks, is the land, can the land value accommodate this requirement? Um, and can it, can it bear a reduction in land value? while still making development feasible. Uh, next slide, a feasibility study, I just wanna really note here is, is different from a nexus study. So what we did is a feasibility study, which like you see on the top of the slide, looks at prototypes, uh, ensures that there's an adequate uh, profit margin and, and um, viability of the development and tests different affordability requirements, whether it's, 5% low income, 10% moderate income, different, um, different requirements. A nexus study uh, is, is a more detailed analysis, and it's meant to provide a legal justification. Uh, and it's especially important and, in fact, necessary when you're imposing a fee. Um, so a lot of cities, when they have an inclusionary ordinance, in addition to um, a requirement that a certain number of units be built, they offer a developer what's called a fee in lieu. You can pay this fee instead of building the units. So if you want a fee, you need to do a nexus study. Um, and a fee is, is very helpful because it creates a fund that the city can then use to um, create the affordable units it's building. So again, we are doing a feasibility study, not a nexus study. Next slide. Uh, these are the inclusionary percentages we, we tested. I'll, I'll walk you through these. Um, these are based off of off nearby cities, um, as well as other cities in California that are socioeconomically and demographically similar. We looked at home price, uh, income, and population size. Um, and we came up with these percentages in consultation with your city planning staff. Uh, you'll see in the, in the darker blue on top, uh, home ownership tends to be uh, at a higher income requirement, mostly moderate. Um, we also tested one low income percentage. So what these mean is we tested if uh, home ownership developments can can withstand uh, a requirement that 15% of their units be affordable to moderate income households. 
Then we tested 12%, if 12% of the units can be affordable to moderate income households. And then we tested if 10% of the units can, can, uh, are affordable to low income households. So we tested all three of those, if, if those maintain um, financial feasibility. Then, um, so that's for the two home ownership prototypes that Craig will talk about. Then for one of the rental uh, prototypes, we tested the percentages in the middle row, 12% low income. So again, if 12% of the units are restricted to low income households, is the project feasible? Then we tested the next one, which is a combination of 6% low income and 6% very low. And then we tested the last one, 8% very low income. Then the final uh, row here, which is a rental fourplex, um, obviously a fourplex is four units. So you can only have an inclusionary requirement that's either 25%, 50%, 75 or 100. You can only have it units of 25%. Um, and so we decided to test just the 25% moderate income requirement um, and, because that's what would uh, uh, avoid a state review. A, a lower income requirement would, would trigger a state review. So we wanted to test if you have inclusionary on fourplexes, um, does that maintain uh, feasibility? Next slide. Um, then just uh, la lastly, before I turn it over to Craig to talk about the results and our prototypes, um, we, we have here, these are the um, affordable sales prices and affordable rents for a four person household or a three, three bedroom home. So the, these are uh, numbers based off of the most recent data available from the state and they're specific to Los Angeles County. Um, and, and then for the sales prices, we conducted some analysis to arrive at these prices. Um, these numbers will likely continue to increase year over year as, as prices increase for homes, um, but we don't expect them to change dramatically. Um, one thing I, I just wanna highlight here is that the moderate income and low income uh, prices, particularly the rent, uh, are very close. This is, uh, we talked about last time how um, the threshold for low income in Baldwin Park and Los Angeles County more broadly is quite high. It's about $94,000 a year salary for a four-person household. Um, this is as a result of uh, very um, specific and quite complicated factors of how those thresholds are calculated. And we don't want to get into those. The, the real point here is that uh, with a very small decrease in price, uh, about $35 a month in rent, you can get a unit to go from being affordable to a moderate income to a low income household. And so if it's, uh, if it's important for the city to achieve low income uh, RENA requirement rather than moderate income, uh, it, would, it would take just a slight increase in, um, in the requirement of the inclusionary ordinance. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Craig to talk more about our four prototypes. Thanks, Farzad. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So uh, first we're gonna describe uh, the two prototypes for ownership housing. We've got small lot, single family development. So this would be, uh, again, relatively small single family homes, generally in a planned unit development. So. Uh, you know, approximately our assumption was a 40 unit uh, uh, development uh, of compact single family homes. Uh, and then we have a condominium townhome typology as well. So there are several of these projects either coming online uh, or have come online in recent years, as well as in the pipeline right now. And the market prices are based on data for a 2000 square foot single family home and a 1,000 square foot condominium on average. Um, these are Baldwin Park's most common new construction housing typologies. Um, so uh, we're, worth noting that this, these product types are, are already being produced. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to rental multifamily housing, um, We've not seen that uh, happen uh, much in Baldwin Park recently, but your housing element anticipates that there could be some SB9 development of fourplexes uh, or uh, you know, multiple uh, units on a formerly single family lot uh, with one home possibly turning out, uh, one, one home lot turning it out four uh, units. 
And then also what we call transit-oriented development apartments. So infill, higher density uh, rental around transit corridors. So our research, as I mentioned, found that the city has not had any uh, substantive new rental apartments built uh, in over 20 years. So this is uh, fundamentally, I think, a challenge when it comes to inclusionary uh, policy. And I think uh, is uh, something worth uh, further consideration and analysis when it comes to add, you know adding an additional inclusionary requirement to multifamily rental that's already not being developed. Um, so what we'd want to look at is to what degree that lack of development is because of land use impediments that are being uh, addressed by the city and to what degree those are because of financial uh, feasibility issues around cost or uh, rent. I don't mean to uh, interrupt you, but since we're on the topic, I do want to ask where you received that information from. Uh, uh, Farzad, maybe you can uh, help with the, uh, sure. the research. Yeah, we, we reviewed uh, all of the um, rental uh, and for sale multifamily housing in the city mm -hmm. through a database known as CoStar, which looks at public records as well as their own private um, records. And the oldest um, multifamily rental home we could find in the city was built in, th that is not the newest, the newest sorry, is was in 1999. Okay, does, how, what, did you consider the Rome project, which is a rental project and it's TOD infill and it was completed in 2018? That's, a, that's an affordable project, right? Right. So we're, we're looking at market rate projects. So the, okay. yeah, and I, I apologize for not specifying this, but of course, if for, for inclusionary purposes, we're looking at market rate development and trying to leverage affordability out of market rate development. So thanks okay. for pointing that out. I apologize for, Thank you. for not specifying that. Okay. Thank you. So um, your housing element estimates that 250 homes could come as a result of the SB9 legislation. And uh, the Turner Center from UC Berkeley estimates that about a thousand new feasible market units could come in this upcoming uh, 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 housing element cycle. So we wanna see if an inclusionary housing ordinance could be feasible. Um, and at, while I'm talking about SB9, just noting that planning staff is going to be doing a presentation on SB9 later tonight to give more information on that. So stay tuned for, for more information on that. Um, and uh, on that note, and we touched on this uh, in the last presentation, we may, you may want uh, to consider setting your, an inclusionary threshold above four units uh, as to not uh, require inclusionary units on uh, SB9 style fourplexes. Um, that would be a, a policy decision by the city, but doing that would effectively help incentivize more SB9 opportunities. So again, stay tuned for more details on SB9 later this evening from Ron. Um, and then also noting inclusionary could be more valuable in downtown transit oriented districts if uh, density is increased, which could impact uh, feasibility. So allowing more units uh, would then come with more affordable units uh, generated, obviously, as a percentage of the total development. So next slide. So it's critical to note that feasibility and inclusionary housing ordinance effectiveness is dynamic. It changes over time as a result of several important variables. These include development costs, sales and rent prices, uh, and area median incomes. Those are all critical variables that go into uh, the feasibility uh, and effectiveness of inclusionary housing. So Baldwin Park is challenged in a lot of ways because it has very similar a very similar cost profile as the rest of the region, but its market rents and prices are somewhat lower in comparison. Um, so that's a strain on feasibility. And then when we look at inclusionary and affordable housing levels, those are the same uh, across the entirety of Los Angeles County. So um, that's a constant, it's not specific to Baldwin Park, which is also uh, you know, challenging in relation to some of those other variables. 
So uh, to summarize, here are the results of our preliminary analysis of the four prototypes and each of the income levels we tested. These are initial assessments that warrant more detailed analysis, but what they do indicate is that inclusionary housing ordinance could be effective across the range of product types in Baldwin Park. Now, one of the challenges here is to get to whether or not, especially again, when it comes to multifamily rental, whether these are feasible in the first place, regardless of an inclusionary housing ordinance. And so I know the city is already looking at that in response to, uh, you know, through the housing element and in response to the RENA requirements. Um, but again, that bears a little bit more research, uh, particularly around cost data. But, uh, but summarizing uh, what we found here, um, starting at the top uh, with the home ownership uh, uh, typologies. With single family, we found that the 12% moderate income requirement could be feasible. I should note that what we mean by feasible, and this is also pretty arcane, um, is that within the context of inclusionary housing and the laws uh, that govern that, uh, um, essentially, what has been established is that a, fea a feasibility um, centers around the impact, as far as I'd referenced earlier, on the land value, the impact on land value. And basically, uh, the, the, the guiding principle is that if land value is decreased by less than 30%, then that's considered a reasonable impact and a reasonable level for uh, inclusionary housing feasibility. And so over 30% would be infeasible. And so that's the threshold we use. So um, I apologize, I know that's, that's complicated, but I thought I should provide the, the backdrop. I'm available to, to answer additional questions uh, on that, but that's the metric. And so what we found is that the 12% moderate income level on single family housing type could be feasible and the 15% moderate income and the 10% low income are likely infeasible. Now, this is probably due to the larger home size. Uh, and when we compare it to the townhome and condominium uh, next to it, we, we found that all three of these levels potentially could be feasible. Um, and one of the reasons there to note is that an affordable home ownership level that Farzad touched on earlier in the presentation is the same for either of these typologies. So again, we've got that affordability component coming in um, that's, that's not only constant across LA County, but constant across home ownership types. Um, whereas uh, the for sale, uh, the, the market uh, sale price on a single family home on a per square foot basis is generally higher than the townhome or condominium considering that it's likely a preferable product in comparison. So that's one of the primary reasons we see greater feasibility on the townhome or condominium level is that the per square foot market level is lower than on the single family. And then we also have smaller units on the townhome or condominium. So our assumption on the single family was all 2000 square foot three bedroom homes. On the condo and townhome, we have a more efficient construction type and a broader range of, of unit sizes as well to achieve affordability. And then moving to the rental types, again, noting uh, as far as I did, the, this fourplex version, we only looked at one option, which was 25% moderate income on a rental. And again, noting that the moderate income rents are relatively close to market rents. And so it's not a, a, it's not a huge financial impact. Uh, at least currently, to require uh, uh, one moderate income unit out of four, uh, not en it, you know, enough that it, it, it remains feasible. And then if we looked at the rental housing, uh, the multifamily rental housing option next to that in the bottom right, what we see is potentially a, a feasible uh, uh, scenario at 12% low income, infeasible if we have 6% low income and 6% very low income, but again, feasible at 8% very low income. And so noting a, 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 the, the reason for the difference between those bottom two, the six and six versus 8%, is that you only have 2% more units at very low income, but the remaining amount, 4%, are back to market rather than at very low income above that. And so, that uh, additional market rate uh, 
you know, 92% market rate as opposed to 88% market rate in the, uh, um, the six plus six scenario above uh, ends up making up for, for the difference, uh, you know, the additional very low income units. And so these are all very close. And again, as I started, they can change significantly over time. So I think that the primary takeaway here is that there is potential feasibility in all four typologies uh, and worth uh, additional research and, and analysis uh, in pursuing this. Um, so uh, let's see, I think that's the presentation on the findings. Next slide, please. So uh, wrapping up, if the city decides it wants to move forward with further analysis and a nexus study, just noting that the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments is making available funds for cities to advance this work, great news. So this uh, can fund all aspects of a full analysis, including a nexus study that Farzad mentioned, which uh, is worthwhile generally in and of itself in terms of having a, a dynamic and flexible inclusionary housing ordinance. And in particular, within the context of things like uh, those fourplexes, again, as far as I've pointed out, because that's such a small number of units, uh, it could be a useful alternative uh, to consider uh, a, a, an in lieu fee instead of uh, a, an on site requirement. So this funding through the San Gabriel Valley COG uh, would be uh, actually a pass through of state uh, REAP funds, Regional Early Action Planning Grant Program funds. Um, and just noting you're not alone at looking at inclusionary housing ordinances. So most of the other cities in the San Gabriel Valley uh, with an ordinance either adopted it recently or are un undergoing an update and others are looking at uh, creating inclusionary housing as well. So that concludes our presentation, and uh, we'd uh, be more than happy to take your questions. Great. Thank you for that. So I think we've been kind of working on this for a year. So after the next steps, when can we expect to have something come to the council? Ron, I think I'm going to need to defer to you to, <laughs> to, to take the first crack at, at that <laughs> response. Good question, Mayor. The, the, the price question. Um, the next steps is if the council would provide direction. Again, as um, as uh, Lasar has mentioned, I, I had a conversation with the San Gabriel, San Gabriel Valley COG planning director's um, uh, representative, and uh, early next year they're going to be uh, uh, opening up funds to fund such programs. So we would have to wait for um, the COG to open that up uh, for us to um, uh, to kickstart that process. Um, so, um, Craig, if you do know uh, roughly, do you have an idea of how long an IHO uh, um, would take to be implemented? You know, I would imagine that uh, that uh, you could get it done in, I, I would estimate, two to three months. Yeah. Well, and the COG did mention they should have, uh, they're rolling it out uh, in February, and as soon as uh, we'll be waiting at the gates to, to submit our proposal. Uh, they would fund it, uh, I would say sometime before the summer or at summer, uh, we could have a, an IHO in place. Great, okay, fine. I think it's, it's an important um, venture to take on, right? We're seeing a lot of development, uh, you know, development that doesn't necessarily fit the needs of the demographic of Baldwin Park and it's, uh, you know, I kind of touched on this in the last meeting, right, we're seeing a exodus, not just out of Baldwin Park, but the San Gabriel Valley and even California on its own. You know, I've been going to the schools and every single elementary has less than 500 students, um, you know, and, and the medium income here is not sustainable for the new type of housing that's coming in. And so as we develop, one of the most important questions that we have to ask ourselves is, how do we develop for the community and not at the expense of it? Um, so I personally, I think it's great that we're doing this, and I and I do think that we need to continue moving forward with it. But I will uh, hold off to hear my colleagues' uh, comments. Mayor. Yes, Councilmember Garcia. Yeah, I, I have a bit of a different perspective on that. Um, I know that one of the challenges in our community, as probably is 
is the case for other San Gabriel Valley communities is we have um, families who have been here in the community for many years, decades, and have raised their children. And now their children are looking for more of that moderate income housing. And, um, you know, they're, they don't necessarily fall into the very low or low income, um, but the are more of that workforce housing. And priority for me was to create moderate income housing. And um, so I think it's, it's important for us to look at very low, low, but also moderate income because you do, you know, I, I've been out there in the community and talked with families who are so frustrated because they want to stay close to their kids who are now raising their own families. Um, they might be nurses or teachers or, you know, um, young professionals. And instead of staying in the community, they're being pushed out going east um, because that's where the, some of the more affordable is available to them. So that's a challenge, and I definitely wanted to highlight it because I don't think we should um, ignore that need in our community. But I also wanted to ask Ron is if you, as you're working with the consultants, if you can keep at the forefront the RENA obligations that have already been called out so that we know what is the target for low, very low, moderate income. It's not just kind of like, you know, let's, let's do this and see what happens, but to be a little more strategic, you know, about, okay, well, Rena calls for X number of low income units. And so how are we going to achieve that? Or the same with moderate income um, or very low income this way where our, our efforts are moving in the direction of achieving our goals as called out by Rena. So I just want to make sure that we keep that at the forefront and uh, don't lose sight of that because I think it definitely provides a roadmap for what we need to do here in our community. Absolutely, um, based on, on community needs. Yeah. Go ahead, Ron. I'm done. Oh, I'm my sorry. I, I, I said absolutely. <laughs> Um, I second that, um, and definitely as we're coming to a close and uh, adopting our housing element in February, uh, February, Mar March, April, um, uh, we are the goals and policies uh, definitely indicate that we uh, make sure that we are uh, keeping a close eye on those targets, uh, especially on the moderate uh, and the and the low income. Great, thank you, Ron, and thank you to the consultants, Lasar. Thank you. Great. Does any other council member have any comments, questions? Uh, so, Ron, speaking of RENA, um, and then I, I think the census might be tied to this, right? Because I, I think last time I heard that one of the reasons our RENA numbers are so high is because our city doesn't grow. But I'm not entirely sure, and I can't specifically quote anybody on that. But, you know, and I kind of mentioned this last time as well. Based on the census, our city, you know, in 2010 lost the residents. I think they lost 0.6%. And then this year we lost 4.6%. Um, so can we expect that because our city isn't growing the way it should, I, I think that's part of the arena trend, right? We want the city to grow and we're adapting as, that's why we're building more. So can we expect our arena numbers to change drastically the next time? That, that's a good question. Um, it could very well be, uh, see a decrease or we could see an increase. Um, uh, I, I think at this time, it's we'd have to wait and see what those numbers would um, uh, come out to be. Uh, but again, they, they could they could surely decrease or, or they could be more than what we're um, programmed for the next eight years. Great. Okay, just a, just a question I think I always kind of keep in mind ever since I saw the new census numbers. Um, but I, it seems that um, there's clear direction for you to keep going. 
um, and just take, of course, several factors in place. Um, but I also would like for you to take that into consideration, you know, the, the census numbers and kind of the trend in our city um, you know, that we kind of haven't grown in 20 years. Um, so that as well, demographics, uh, the market trend, uh, you know, uh, the concerns Council Member Garcia shared as well. Just kind of keep them all in concern, uh, keep them all in mind as we navigate this IHO. Absolutely, we'll keep those in mind as we move forward with uh, uh, with next steps. Great, thank you, Ron, and thank you to the consultants. And Ron, this is Yuriko with um, Parks and Recreation. Just as a side note, we do have additional funding cycles as part of the new. Um, the new measure H fiscal year. So if there is any additional opportunities and if we're interested in aligning those efforts with the future funding cycles, then we would also be looking into alternative uh, funding sources. So um, it could be COG, it could be measure H. And um, I know that the Blue Ribbon Commission will also be looking into some of those um, areas highlighted in tonight's presentation. So if there are any additional funding sources that could come quicker, um, we can definitely address that with council at, a, at an upcoming uh, meeting. Perfect. Thank you, Eureka. Great. I believe, so I believe we, we've con we're concluding our presentation. Thank you to staff, our consultants, Ron, for that great presentation. So I believe at this point, that is all of our official business in the open session, and we will now recess to closed session. Mr. Mayor, uh, I, I, there was a case that I wanted to have on that I mistakenly uh, 